So Ms. Gumman, we ended with People's Exhibit 478, and that was admitted into evidence. I'll let the jury look at that afterwards, but that essentially is a compilation of all the certifications, correct? Four six eight. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. And then um, I had misspoke and said that you didn't include the failed test, but you corrected everyone. It's actually included in there. Yes. And when the jury sees it, it indicates a failed test. Yes. So that was in 2008. And then later in 2008 through 2015, that's the package that is 468 for them to review later? Yes. Has it been admitted? Yes. Your Honor, the, our objection then to the admission of this would be relevant. It's been admitted. Relevant. It's been admitted. <laughs> so we're done. You don't get to argue three times, okay? Well, How many was, times have we had this conversation with and ran over the years? I have no idea. Your Honor, I didn't object relevance. I'm sorry at what I said. I think was I don't understand the basis with which it's coming in, and that was where it was left, I think. so. Uh, no, that was after I admitted when you said that, okay? Okay. So you get a chance to object. I get to rule, and then we move on. So I, we'll I wasn't certain you'd ruled, so thank you. I appreciate the comment. All right. So, Ms. Gummin, and then <clears throat> so far we've talked about your credentials, and then we talked about Molly a little bit. We talked about Molly's breed, and then we talked about Molly's training. I want to segue now to Molly's experience in the field. How many years did you work, Molly, out on searches? Um, I worked her from 2008 to um, 2016 or 17. How many, has she recovered human bodies working out in the field? Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to object to this line of inquiry. These, this witness will testify that reliability is not established by things that happen out in the field. It's been repeated over and over again in proceedings on this particular issue. So the fact that there are previous occasions that don't go towards reliability, we object to any further testimony about that. Okay. And that's consistent with Your, your Honor's ruling that it's, it, the reliability as established by certification. And I, I think, I know this witness will agree and has in the past that reliability is not based on things that happen in the field because you can't confirm it. You're fooled, and it's certainly an area of uh, cross examination and potentially other witnesses. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. And I would cite to Brooks as well as a factor that I do have to cover and will cover. Right. So we were talking about breed and training, but now we're going to talk about field experience. And I asked you the question, has she actually recovered human bodies in the times that you've worked there? Yes. How many, roughly? Um, she's assisted in the recovery of approximately 14 or 15 whole bodies. Okay. And so is this in the context, for example, of like search and rescue or uh, different crime scenes, all those types of contexts? In a variety of different situations, yes. When you say um, assisted in recovering the human body, this is a case where you know a body to have been found at the end of her search. Um, later learned that human remains were recovered in the area of where she worked and then provided her trained final response. Got it. And then in addition to that, has she done cases where she's searched a house, let's say in search and rescue, and cleared that house with no indications and that person is later found to be alive and well? Your Honor, objection, we lack the discovery to challenge this evidence. This witness would be required in the Rule 16 based on previous rulings of this court. If this information can be presented to the jury, it's something that we should have been provided well, in remember, a way that we could double check it. We just don't have it. I remember this testimony from a couple of years ago. And so uh, if you'd wanted something that you didn't have, you certainly could have asked for it in the past two years. You're overruled. We yes, did. Your Honor. We did. The judge, well, did you bring it back up to me that you didn't get it? Yes. Yes, Judge, you ruled on this. Okay. There was a motion filed and the court ruled that the people had complied with discovery. I provided a list of these cases to Mr. Moran nearly two years ago. And as the court pointed out, this was done at the hearing as well. All right. And we were not able to corroborate these because there were years and general reasons <clears throat> and there just isn't police reports going back that far. Well, that's, that's not a reason to object and say it's not right. I mean, you can point that out to the jury, which you just have. You can do it again on cross-examination. Uh, you're overruled. <laughs> And then, Judge, finally, I know the court had said no speaking objections, but at this point, there's been several, and it's, it's uh, interrupted. I understand. Thank you, Judge. 
So I'm going to come back to this very same topic. So um, you had talked about 14 or 15 bodies recovered. And then you talked about a search and rescue context where Biddy would go into a home and clear it, and that would be corroborated later as well, a person's alive and well. Yes. And then is there also situations where Biddy had done work in a case and you didn't have information as to where remains were, but later it was corroborated that remains had once been there, but were then removed? Yes. Injection that would require reliance on hearsay for her to understand that. And the other injections, I, uh, objections I, I need to uh, include here. But hearing about these things later in evidence that has not been provided to us is, is a, a due process well, issue. Well, hold on, hold on. This is the exact same thing that we did two years ago. So it has been provided to you, number one. I've already made a ruling on discovery, number two. And number three, it's being offered to show that she was accurate, at least from this witness's perspective, not for the truth of the matter asserted. Because of things people told her later, which would be to the... I, I made my ruling, okay. and I understand your objection. I'm sorry you don't understand my rulings, but please accept my rulings. Have a seat. Helpful for counsel, it's in Discovery, page 23950 through 23952. Thank you very much. 23950? Yes. So I want to talk about some of those instances, but before I do, is it standard practice in the field of handling to ask later and try to find out if information is corroborated by findings in case? Um, the practice that I practice is um, I don't want to know a lot um, for reasons we'll talk about. And um, I do my work with the dog, give the information of what I'm getting or not getting from that animal, and later um, request that if they receive any information to provide that to me um, at a later date. Okay. So you'll put simply, you'll follow up after your dog's indicated, you avoid the information up front, but afterwards you'll follow up to see if your dog was successful. Correct. Is that part of how handlers assess reliability in the field? Um, I look at it as um, a way for I want to know where my dogs um, are doing well and not doing well. So the example I would give is um, if I went into a house and my dog started providing its trained final response all over the house, and then they later find the person alive and well, um, that's really concerning to me. So I would probably remove that dog from the field in that nature of work. Okay. So I'm, a, I'm being careful with the term reliability sure, sure. In, in the field. So, so you want to know if your dog messes up because someone could get in trouble when they shouldn't? Yes. And you also want to know if, for example, someone confesses later and then you learn there were actually human remains or a bit indicated. Direction leading. That was leading. You can ask, get to that a different way, I think. Sure. Is it also helpful information to know when there's a witness or a confession as to the location of remains where an indication is been? Absolutely. So let's talk about um, some examples of Biddy in the field. Um, I want to start with the actual uh, bodies she's located so that the jury can get a sense for how that looks. Was there a case in January of two, uh, 2009 where there was a missing duck hunter and she did a water search? Yes. Can you explain that to the jury, please? Um, on that case, I was actually requested to travel hold, to... Hold on a second. Your objection? Objection relevant. This is not generally relied upon in the field. Reliability is not based on things that happen in the field, so this is uh, not relevant. This is a way for the jury to assess how, how good a job the dog did, so it's appropriate and it's relevant. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. So we were talking about January 2009, a missing duck hunter and Molly search. Yes, I was requested to travel to um, Pennsylvania and a young man had perished during a duck hunting accident in a waterway, a tributary of the Delaware River. Um, Molly and I uh, conducted a water search on a boat, 
and um, she provided her trained final response that she detected the odor of human remains in a specific area um, in the waterway and a side scan sonar operator who I've worked with in the past um, utilized that information to conduct a water search with the sonar and located the young man's body. Now, in the January 2009 duck hunter case, was there also a second body that no one was aware of that Molly assisted with? During that search. Ducks are leading. That's not leading, that's changing to a different topic uh, in this area, so it's fine. During that search, because the Delaware has tides coming in and going out, um, the area where the boat accident occurred was up a tributary. So for 12 hours, water was traveling up, and for 12 hours, it was traveling back down. So in an effort to be as helpful as possible, um, I did a lot of water searching away from the area of the accident and at the mouth of the Delaware River where the tributary went in, Molly began to provide her trained final response that she detected the odor of human remains um, out in the water near some pylons. Um, it didn't make sense because the boat accident occurred so far away, about a mile away. Um, and I gave the information to the folks searching for his remains and learned later in the, I think I was there in January in the spring, um, a body was recovered in that area who had been um, most likely a suicide. Um, so does water carry the order? Right, if, if I may, uh, objection that what she's just testified to would have required here to say we've never been discovered this information this is brand new to us. Um, it's a due process consultation right to counsel issue. All right, has, has this been provided to the defense? Yes, Your Honor. You want a copy? I don't need a copy. Do you have a discovery number for? Uh, yes, 23950, Your Honor. All right, you're overruled. And there's an additional document as the. 23950. 23950. And as the court recalls, after defense filed the motion, I actually provided an additional document that gave the case numbers, et cetera, so that counsel had that as well. All right. So now I'm going to um, ask you a follow-up question. So does waterways carry the odor of human remains? Your Honor, I'm looking at it. It does not mention Delaware unless that's someplace in Wisconsin. You want to show him what you've got? So, Judge, yes. Or show me. I don't sure. Mr. McCoy, what page are you showing me? Paragraph talks about Pennsylvania. It talks about a second body being found. Geography was one of my strong points. <laughs> Pennsylvania and Delaware are two different places. All right. This was the problem that we had with what was provided. We called Delaware. Or we called Pennsylvania. <sighs> Judge, may I proceed with my direct examination? Well, could you? Could you explain the difference? Between, and maybe I missed it because I was trying to look something up, anticipating objections, which I probably shouldn't have been doing. Um, but why the discrepancy between Pennsylvania and Delaware? The Delaware River. Oh, thank you. In Pennsylvania? You did say you were called to Pennsylvania on that case, didn't you? Yeah. Um, right. Philadelphia? All right. I, I'm not good at geography. Your objection's overruled. Thank you, Judge. All right, uh, so Ms. Gumman also, um, in October of 2012, was there another example of work that K-9 Molly did where she sniffed a vehicle and later a body was located in another county? Um, I believe that was uh, City of Eau Claire. They had a missing person. Um, they initially had uh, Molly and I sniff a vehicle that she did indicate that a provider of trained final response that she detected the odor of human remains. And during that search effort, um, we were taken to another county and did a, a sniff where she again 
provided her train final response and they recovered the body buried in the location of her train final response. Did they later learn from a confession the why the vehicle was important to the case? Um, I learned later that they did get information, um, co-conspirator and the confession that the body had been transported in the vehicle that K-9 Molly indicate, provided her train final response to. And then as one final case example of body recovery, was there a January of 2013 uh, search by Molly on a frozen lake where she indicated on the lake and then later sonar was used? Um, the city of Madison, we had a missing adult male and video footage of him leaving a hotel near one of our lakes in the winter. Um, we began a search effort for him with uh, the horses, the dogs, and um, I ended up putting quite a bit of time into searching um, the frozen lake behind the hotel. Molly did provide her train final response in a very focused area about a half mile out on the lake. Um, those were marked by a GPS given to another individual who operates underwater camera and side scan sonar. And in the spring, he went to that location with his uh, equipment and um, about 30 feet down, um, about 90 feet out, he ended up getting capturing a video of the deceased person um, consistent with the area of K-9 Molly's indication, train final response. So that body was recovered 30 feet under the frozen lake? Um, in the spring when the water melted is when they did the actual recovery. Okay. You talked about also a very important point that Molly can't go into a house and indicate and then um, you wouldn't want to find out later that someone was alive, for example, right? Correct. So are there examples on search and rescue? I want to ask you a few where Molly went into the house, cleared it, and the person was found to be all right. Um, I've had occasions where she and I were utilized to conduct a sniff in a house where she did not provide her train final response. Let me direct your attention to August of 2011 with a missing seven-year-old boy. Um, can you tell the jury about that case? That was in the city of Madison, and um, we had a report that he was missing, and his 16-year-old brother was supposed to be watching him. Um, I got called in the wee hours of the morning to respond and initially conduct a trail um, with my patrol dog, and then um, we utilized Molly in the house, and she did not indicate to a large source of human remains odor and the young boy the next morning was found having gone to the neighbor's house and was alive and well. So another case in June of 2012 involving a um, pole barn and information that there might be a body buried. Um, in that particular case, it was in Douglas County, northern Wisconsin. Um, the agency called and asked if I would um, come up and assist them in a search. They had received a tip from uh, that a woman claimed while she was intoxicated in a bar that she had killed a man and buried him in a pole barn um, not far from where she had lived at the time. Um, so it was arranged. I got up to the area um, and give, we were uh, asked to search this pole barn and the other outbuildings that were at the property. We searched it all. She never provided her train final response that she detected the odor of human remains. And I reported that to the uh, department investigating. They then went to the owners of the property to explain why the dog was there. And the owners of the property said there had not been a pole barn on that property even at the time of the incident. And then finally, I want to draw your attention to March of 2014. Was Molly used related to a missing teenage female and sniffing the boyfriend's vehicle? Um, the city of Madison, again, uh, asked me to come in and conduct a sniff simply of a young woman that was missing in her boyfriend's car. Um, it had gotten to be kind of standard protocol for us to utilize the human remains detection dog in those situations. 
She sniffed the car, did not indicate to a large source of human remains odor. And um, obviously that was reported to the investigator and the young woman was found alive and well and the boyfriend's car had nothing to do with it. So is it fair to say that Molly doesn't indicate on every residence or every car that she searches? That is correct. Finally, I wanna ask you about were there cases where canine Molly indicated and no actual human remains were located, but later information was received that human remains had been there and then moved? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna draw your attention to October of 2010 in a strangulation case. Um, do you recall what case I'm talking about? Um, the... Crawford County yes. Sheriff's? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that case, please? I received a call from the Crawford County Sheriff's Department that a young man had come in and confessed that he had um, strangled and disposed of his girlfriend four years earlier. Um, she had been reported missing and has never been located. They asked me if I could um, go into the apartment where he reported that this all had occurred and with the uh, human remains detection dog indicate. I explained that I didn't know if four years after the fact, if that would be relevant or capable or not, but I would certainly check. I asked him not to tell me anything beyond the very basic I um, did a mutual aid through my own department, traveled down there, and Molly was taken off leave, asked to search through the apartment, and she provided um, three trained final responses that she detected the odor of human remains in the apartment. Um, one was in a closet, one was in the living room, and one was in a bedroom. Um, you could not see anything. Um, and after I was completely done, they provided me a um, hand-drawn map by the young man, and there were X, three X's where the three indications had occurred. Were those locations that he had told them the body had been? Yes. Uh, was there another case in October of 2012 with a basement and a staircase leading up to the first floor and then a freezer in the corner of the basement as well? Um, I believe that was for the Dane County Sheriff's Department, which is the county around my city in Wisconsin. They had a missing disabled adult male and um, his older brother was supposed to be caring for him. A uh, period of time passed and they couldn't find him. I was asked to go with investigators to with K-9 Molly and they um, asked for consent for Molly and I to sniff the interior of a home. Molly provided her trained final response on a basement staircase one step and in a far corner of the basement where nothing was, there was no objects there. Um, I was later told by the investigating detective that the brother that was supposed to care for the young man did confess, took them to where the body had been buried in the woods. And he said that he had stored his brother's body in a freezer in the basement in the corner where canine Molly had indicated and it transported the body up and down the staircase. And then finally, in November of 2013, was there another case where someone gave away a deep freezer and you were asked to do a search? Yes, um, that was um, City of Fond du Lac, which is another um, area in our state. Uh, man um, was missing and his wife uh, did not know or would not give where she knew he was or wasn't. Um, the initial information was the wife suddenly sold the deep freezer of theirs. So the police asked if K-9 Molly and I would um, sniff the freezer if they were to retrieve it back. Um, it was brought on a flatbed trailer in a parking lot and Molly was off lead and um, indicated 
provided or trained final response to the odor of human remains at the freezer. Um, we were later involved in further searching at the home and the wife eventually confessed and um, that she had shot her husband while he was in the shower and had stored the body in the freezer for a period of time until she took the body and disposed of it. Are these just some examples of the work that Molly's done out in the field? Yes. <clears throat> um, is it fair to say there are different areas and surfaces involved, anything from waterways to freezers, tarps, vehicles, houses, things like that? Yes. She's worked in all these different settings? In many different settings she has worked. What's the longest time that's passed from the time that the human remains were present and Molly was able to give you information that there had been human remains there? Um, the Crawford County case was four years after the body had been removed in an apartment that she was able to, that particular case, uh, provide her trained final response that she detected the odor of human remains. So in this case, uh, you did your work in August of 2013 and February of 2014. Does that sound right? In reference to this case, yes. yes. And Dylan Redwine, are you aware, went missing in November of 2012? Um, I knew that my involvement was quite a bit of time after he went missing. So several months later, even a year, based on uh, what Molly's done before, as well as training, et cetera, is she capable of detecting the odor of human remains that length of time out? Objection meeting. When you were asked to respond to Colorado in August of 2013 and again in February 2014, did you feel that this was work that Molly was capable of doing? Yes. Okay. And is Molly capable of doing that work only if biological matter is left behind or is this an odor that she can detect whether there's biological matter or not? We would, um, Molly was trained to detect the odor of human remains. Whether there still remains there or not, that is what she's trained to detect. That, that same odor, whether the remains are there or whether the remains have been removed. It's possible that she could indicate once remain, remain, human remains are removed, yes. Like in Crawford County? Yes. Let me talk through a, a few principles with you before you get to your work in this case, just so that the jury understands the concepts as we move through that work. So there was some reference early on in your testimony to human remains detection canines versus cadaver dogs, right? Yes. What do human remains detection canines actually locate? Um, human re I'm gonna back up one step. When we're alive, we all have distinct odor. That is what a sense-specific trailing dog follows, the cloud that you leave behind. When human beings pass into biological death, you immediately begin to decompose, but... I'm gonna object, this is non-responsive. I think it is responsive. She's trying to explain what her answer is gonna to be to the question. And I think if it's non-responsive, I think no, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Thank you, you're describing the odor. When we pass into biological death, we become generic human cadaver odor. What that means is, if we were all down, deceased in this room for a week, my cadet Molly would have come in and simply indicated to any of the decomposing bodies, she would not recognize my odor um, because it's generic. My, my, sense, my specific odor after a period of time, goes away. Therefore, cadaver dogs can provide their trained final response to the odor of human remains, but it is not specific to any one person. So it's the unique odor that is emitted at death? Um, it's generic human remains odor at okay. death. What kinds of things constitute human remains? Um, well, you have fresh decomposition to skeletal remains. Okay. What about like a large amount of blood? Would that be human remains potentially? 
um, when human, I'm sorry, when human blood hits the air, it will immediately begin to decompose. And a human remains detection dog may provide its trained final response to that odor, but the dog cannot provide information as to whether the blood is from a live person or a deceased person. Okay. Now, what, what's to stop Molly from just indicating on like skin cells that I drop or a hair that I drop off my head? Um, that's a good question. Well, um, I do train with large amounts of human hair, but I don't do a strand of hair. So that threshold to indication for her to search and look for one strand of hair, although it wouldn't be wrong if she indicated, it was not something I trained her to do because it could cause information in a house that is not um, useful to the investigation. Right. So you trained her. With, you trained her with large sources of actual human remains, so that. Well, let me ask a different question. If she would indicate on a hair or skin cells, would she be of any use in the work that you do? Based on my um, wanting to simply provide information when we sniff with the dogs, that would not be of any benefit to anybody. Right. Um, someone could be completely uninvolved in something and the dog would come in and suddenly indicate in their bathroom. Um, and that was something I had uh, trained to a small amount with Cleo and found it was not helpful. And you're talking about blood with Cleo? Yeah, a little bit of blood, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, although it's interesting and fascinating, um, it was not helpful to an investigation one way or the other. So with um, Molly, I purposely tried to train her
Um, there's a lot of discussion about that, but I think um, I keep it simple. Odor is odor. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's faint, it's lingering, it's residual. And do you train, when you do your training problems, do some of those problems incorporate the idea of residual odor, for example? Um, you know, I, I try really hard to kind of stick to really good fundamentals. However, there have been occasions where myself and teams that I mentor need to basically know where their dog is at, meaning I may come into this room and set a cooler full of human remains in here for four hours, remove it, and a week later ask a handler, put your dog to work and tell me if you get anything or not. And if they get something, where? And can they make any sense of it to report the information to the police? Simply that the dog is giving its trained final response to the odor of human remains. And if the dog doesn't indicate, that's okay too, because we're always trying to evaluate that dog's knowledge base, database, and experience. You talked about some peer reviewed literature regarding residual odor, right? Yes. Is there one study that you can just briefly explain to the jury that involved carpet squares and whether residual odor would remain? Yes. Um, in a nutshell, there was research done in 2007. Um, a forensic pathologist in Europe took three Hamburg, Germany, cadaver, or I'm sorry, human remains detection dogs, and did an experiment with them. He took carpet squares and exposed the carpet squares to... Hold on a second. You're objecting? Objection. This is beyond the scope of this witness's expertise. I think I've already ruled on this, and I've ruled against you on it. So uh, that really stands. It's just a different example of the same thing. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the um, carpet squares were exposed to a freshly decomposed body, someone who had passed less than three hours, and the carpet squares were exposed to that odor but not touching for 10 minutes and two minutes. And then he ran a series of um, runs with the dog, and it was unknown to the handlers, and they found that the dogs were 98% reliable on indicating to the carpet squares that had been exposed to the odor but not touching for 10 minutes, um, out to about two months. 65 days, sound right? Yes. Okay. Is there also a study in 2015 by a Dr. Michael Alexander? Yes. He, he uh, also did peer-reviewed research in 2015. Um, and quite a bit was covered in the research, um, but he utilized eight human remains protection dogs certified in three, from three different organizations. So it varied. Four of them were, since, I'm sorry, four of them were. Hold on just a second. Is this the same I beg your pardon. The objection is different in okay. that I, I'm not familiar with this one. I don't know that it's been disclosed. I don't recall it being provided in the expert disclosures for this witness. It may have been, but. Um, Mr. Johnson, do you have it handy? I don't have it handy, Your Honor. I do. That uh, didn't count. Oh. No, it's just a, it's a published study from 2015, Judge. Um, I don't have a handy. So you don't think it was, you don't know if it was discovered or not? I, I thought that it was, but no, I don't know if it was. I'm positive carpet squares were early okay, on. Well, that's our, that part's already in. This is okay. a little bit different, and so just move on. Thank you. So let me ask you a more general question about across the literature. Has it been explored that residual odor will remain for a long period of time? It is beginning to be explored, and where the dogs are unable to indicate to the odor, that's what we don't know. Okay. So have there been studies, generally speaking, that would suggest that residual odor remains longer than a year, for example? There is some research out there showing that it goes past a year, yes. And that's based is that consistent with your experience in the field with Molly as well? 
And based off of that one case, um, she indicated four years after a person had been strangled and left in an apartment for three days. And have other cases that you've done had some period of time passed prior to Molly doing her work? Um, in cases, yes. Okay. And then that's talking about residual odor. Is there also examples out there of canines finding very old bones, things like that? Yes. Um, there has been recent work um, utilizing human remains detection dogs to find historic sites um, in other countries. So the dogs are trained for um, helping assist in locating graves from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And they'll find those bones underground? Um, from what I've read, um, there has been some success with the dogs. Um, a couple of move to strike. Again, that's the same ruling based upon her expertise as a trainer, the underlying principles, but I'd like you to move off this topic if you would, Mr. Johnson. Yes, Your Honor. So two more other topics I just want to touch on very briefly. Consent be transferred, like for example, consent be transferred if someone's handling a human remains and then touches something, for example, can that scent carry over? Yes, and I, I know that based off of my own experience, um, having placed remains out and then gone and opened a door with the gloves still on and a dog team comes in and provides its trained sound response at the door handle. Not wrong, but I didn't mean to set it up that way. But their noses can be that sensitive. Yes. And then finally, with rewarding with regard to your dog, do you re reward um, Molly only when she has a trained final response or is your reward system different? So we're going to talk, that would talk a little bit about uh, philosophies in dog training and handling. Because cadaver dog work is a lot of elimination work, um, often we search for days with nothing being found. Um, I chose to train and work with my dogs and train other teams that work under me and with me um, that I want the dog to work for a period of time, whether that dog gives me its trained sound response or if that dog gives me nothing. I still give the dog its reward toy so the dog knows you did a good job today and you don't have to make up trained final response in order to get that thing you love the most, your reward toy. So that is just a practice that I've been doing for a long time with both narcotic dogs and um, cadaver dogs. Is that characterized as rewarding the work, not the result? I look at it as I want to set that dog up to know all day long we're good. If you don't have anything, I'm happy with you. And the only way I can do that is to continually play with them. Now that reward is not over the top, super excited. Um, the best example I can give is if I'm called to sniff a car for narcotics with my patrol dog, I would do two circles around. And if the dog didn't indicate, meaning the dog didn't have odor, I would step away and then hand the dog its toy and say, good boy, and put him up in the car. And I just feel, based off of a lot of reward-based training, if I don't indicate or if I don't reward throughout a training and or search day, it gets confusing for the dog. And pretty soon, the dog might start to think it's extinction training, which means I'm trying to undo something. But also, for me personally, I feel that um, it makes us a more honest team. And then finally, are you aware of the concept of queuing? Yes. Can you tell the jury what is queuing? Um, so queuing is if there's a lot of uh, different concepts out there. But basically, it started with um, uh, Hans 
Cleaver was a horse person in the 1800s who claimed that he had taught his horse how to count. And that was not exactly what was going on. It was like a parlor trick. So the dog, or I'm sorry, the horse would scrape five or six times and then whatever he did to, to cue it to that's your count. What is, um, what is cueing itself? Is okay. That... Um, so cueing would be um, as a handler, um, if I keep the dog in the area for a long period of time, or um, there's one thing to present detailing, but it's another thing almost to prompt the dog into a train final response is the best example I can give. So the dog responding to an in, um, a signal from the handler as opposed to an actual odor. Yes. So it might be, you know, do I, I know that source is by that Kleenex box. And so I let my dog go and the dog goes over and keeps going, but I stand still right in front of it. Um, and those, some of it is subconscious and some of it is conscious cueing by handlers. Always a big concern in the field of detection work. Okay. Are you aware of the Lisa Litt studies that talk about cueing? Yes. Generally speaking, what are they, what are they about? Um, so Lisa Litt's research, I believe it came in, it came out in about 2007. And um, it uh, had explosive and narcotics dog handlers. Um, and they did an experiment and they told them you're going to go into spaces where there's your target odor. And so handlers went in and um, did a horrible job, and they, uh, the dogs gave a lot of what we call false indications, meaning there's no source there, so you should not be hitting. And as a result of that research, a lot of good ideas came from it in terms of our handlers um, going in with preconceived ideas that could cause false indications um, up to whoever's doing the evaluating, um, if they're standing close or giving a secondary behavior of their own that would cause the dog to inadvertently um, provide a string final response. So are there things that you do in your practice as a handler to avoid cueing? Um, as a result of that research and, um, and just um, for my, my own person, um, I do some things that I feel are more beneficial in their general practices. So, um, and it's evolved over time with just the experience of being in the field doing this work. One of the things that I always ask is if I'm the handler going to do a search, I don't want to know a lot. I mean, I, I need to know some basic information, um, but I don't want to know a lot. Um, I also try to do as much off lead searching as I can. There are occasions where I have to have the dog on a leash for safety reasons. Um, and sort of my philosophy is if my dog is off lead and gives its trained final response, then and only then will I get involved with what we refer to as detailing. And probably the best way you're knowledgeable of that is <clears throat> a narcotic dog handler goes up to a vehicle and you see the handler and the dog move through the space and the handler's hand is actually directing the dog's nose. And it's areas of odor opportunity, um, so a vertical seam, so that we're getting that dog slowed down a little bit in detailing. Um, I try as much as possible for the dog to work off lead. And then I also have parameters of time in my mind. So if I were to come into this space, and search on a case where someone, the police think there was foul play and there might have been a body in there. Um, I would take the dog off lead, let her work, and after a period of, you know, a space like this, and again, I'm looking just to tell them if the odor of human remains, a large source of human remains is present. I'm not looking for drops of blood. I don't feel that's my job as a handler. Um, I would, in my mind, sweep through one way, sweep through another, meaning she would be off lead and I would move through the area. In my mind, I'm thinking of, has her nose been everywhere it can be? And within five minutes or three minutes, if she's not showing some interest in a space, 
we're out the door. And what I say to law enforcement is, my dog is not indicating that she has the odor of human remains. So off leash or off lead, um, you have minimal facts going in as to particular areas, for example, and then you're not going to let your dog stay in there forever until there's an indication. You're going to let your dog clear the room, get out. Correct. I would rather miss than get a false alert. Um, in addition to that, do you keep other people out of the way as, oh. as your dog's working? So another concern that is always being explored is, did the law enforcement that came into the space inadvertently cue me to cue the dog? I think that's a good way to put it. So one of the things I say, first of all, um, we try to train with other people around so the dog is used to people moving through a space because you can't help it. Um, but I'll often say, can you just stay out of the way? And um, I'll be honest, I don't pay a lot of attention while I'm physically working an area where anybody is at. Um, but I do ask that they stay out of the way. Um, and then finally, um, the certification process is that, a, that these national agencies do with your dog, does that account for queuing to make sure that your dog's actually able to be accurate? As a certifying official, um, the best way I can describe it is um, I just really want that handler to legitimately work the area and tell me if they have odor or not and where it is. So. Um, what I'll do is I'll have traffic cones identifying the area, and I usually give them a description of, you see your parameters, and then go search, and I'll stay out of the area. I may bring a folding chair and sit down, um, but I just want to stay out of the area because I don't want to influence anything, and inadvertently I might, just by standing in a spot randomly. And then the handler going into a certification process doesn't know where the items are. Um, it's single blind, so they don't know where it's at. Let's segue to the work on this case. So were you contacted by investigators uh, to come out and do some searches in the Bill and Redline disappearance? I don't recall how I initially got involved. Um, I believe that uh, Jean and Sandy Rolf Ralston are site and sonar individuals who I've done a lot of work with around the United States. And Jean and Sandy um, were contacted about a waterway near to where um, Dylan went missing. Um, I'm going to say this wrong, uh, Val Valacino Lake. Valacita. Valacita Lake. I think that's where it was. Okay. So Jean had originally asked me to get involved. I was unavailable, so I had another team go work the water. Did you come out here to do specific tasks in August of 2013? With a regard to searches related to the case? Yes. Okay. And did you travel from Wisconsin to Durango? Yes, we flew here. Are you paid for your efforts or is it a volunteer capacity? Um, I've always volunteered my services for searching. So are you paid costs for your travel, oh, etc.? Um, I, I do ask that my um, travel costs be covered by whoever the agency is, because otherwise I wouldn't have a house. <laughs> But other than that, you do it on a volunteer capacity when you came here? Yes. Um, what's the process regarding the facts that you're going to have going into searches? You know, every situation is a little bit different. Um, so... Um, let me ask you, let me be more, I'll, I'll be a little more direct so we can uh, move through this introductory part. So. Are you sometimes brought to like a briefing that has some general information about a case, something like that? Yes. And then as you're receiving information about a case, do you ever allow investigators to tell you locations where physical evidence has been located, for example? I would not want to know that information just based off of my general practices. Are your general practices to specifically avoid knowing like, let's use the example where blood evidence was located. I would not want to know that. Or where another handler had worked the dog. Would you want to know that? That I wouldn't want to know either because I don't know anything about the other dog. Okay. So when you came to Durango to do this work, did you know generally that there was a missing child? I did. And did you know generally that that missing child had last been seen with his father at his father's house? Yes. Okay. 
Did you know anything about the processing of the house itself by law enforcement or anything like that? I don't recall. That was several years ago. What specifically I knew at the beginning. Um, so I'll have to say I don't recall. Would that maybe be a better question for the investigators themselves? Yes. You do write reports in your cases, right? I do document all my work. And when you document, do you document the findings that Molly has in any given case? Um, every case that I do, I write a, what I refer to as similar to a police report where it provides who called, the general information, and any outcome, whether it was we searched and got nothing or we searched and this is what we got. Okay. So when you came here, did you know whether you were going to be um, finding evidence of human remains odor or whether you are going to be clearing a house of no evidence of human remains odor? From what I recall, one of the reasons we were coming out was to um, conduct a further searching for um, human remains on a mountain side where some remains had been found. Okay. And then as um, I met the investigators. I always try to um, provide them with Cadaver 101, Human Remains Detection Dog 101, so they can make a decision on what information they would want to explore with the tool, the dog. So you knew there were going to be remains on the mountainside generally. Did you know the locations exact of those remains when you did your work? Um, I don't recall. Um, when we went out there, I knew that some remains had been recovered. I was under the impression that we were there to see if we could find additional remains. Um, they, from what I recall, they gave an area and said this is where some of it's been found. Okay. And with regard to the house itself, did you, uh, is there something called elimination that you could potentially be doing at, a, at someone's home? Um, as a general practice, if someone goes missing, the dogs are useful in trying to identify um, where anything happened or didn't happen. Um, so that would have been explained to them that the dog could be utilized to um, sniff vehicles, cars, I'm sorry, houses, businesses, um, any area that to help eliminate, because that's good information for an investigation. So when you go in, do you go into the preconceived notion of whether you're going to be finding evidence or eliminating a, an area? I've learned not to have any expectations of what will or will not happen during a search. So let's start with August 5th of 2013. Did you, were you asked to search some clothing with Molly? Yes. Okay, what were you asked to search? I was told that um, the investigators had collected clothing from um, Dylan's father, and they wanted to know if Molly could sniff the clothing for the odor of human remains. Okay. And can you explain to the jury how that search of the clothing went? So I spent some time um, trying to get basic information about how it's stored, where it's stored, um, but they um, took, I, I always want to do it in a clean area. So the first thing we did was we went to an outbuilding that had concrete floors. And I went in there and let Molly off lead and gave her a command to search for the odor of human remains and moved her through that space to make sure there wasn't something that she indicated to that had nothing to do with the case. Um, she did not indicate and then I put her back up, and they brought in three bags. Okay. So that first part, is that basically to clear the room? Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's not um, odor of human remains that's correct, but unrelated to the investigation. Okay. After you cleared the room, how many bags of clothes did they bring in? They initially, uh, well, they brought in three bags of clothes, and they set the three bags out. I didn't know what was in the bag. Um, they were spaced apart. And um, I brought uh, Molly in and took her off traffic lead and said, go oh, find. And she, I just stood back and she went and um, moved through the space. 
and um, she provided a trained final response to a bag um, within a couple of moments of being in the uh, space of those three bags. Okay. So, Judge, can I approach the exhibits? You may. Thanks. They were um, brown bags. Yeah. And is it uh, the three bags? Can you tell the jury which bag the uh, canine indicated on, if any? Um, initially, she indicated that first run through off lead, she indicated to one bag. Um, I moved her away, did my usual reward calmly gave her a second, took the toy away, and then put her back to work, wanting to just observe if she um, could sniff the other two bags. So she went over and she did indicate on a second bag, um, providing her trained final response that she detected the odor of human remains, she sat. And I did the same thing, moved her away, gave her a toy for a moment, um, just telling her she's a good girl for working, took the toy away, and then um, sent her a third time. And the third bag, she went up to it. She dropped her nose. She sniffed. She turned around and looked at me. And she kept walking. She did not indicate to that final of the three bags. So train final response on two out of three evidence bags. Yes. Then did were the items taken out of the bags for further work? I don't know why I asked, but I said, is there more than one object in that bag, the third one that she sniffed at and looked at me and then walked away. So um, they removed the items out of the three bags and I had put her up, brought her back out and they asked me to re-sniff the items while they were outside the bag. Okay. And we talked about a lot of this, but is this work done off lead? I do it all off lead. Okay. Investigators, are they allowed anywhere near hovering by the items or are they backing away? Um, as a general practice, and that was a while ago, um, I would have asked for them to just back away from the area. So she had free reign and um, for the reasons that we talked about, not wanting to have any misunderstood behaviors by anybody. And let me just clarify this. When you say your general practice, are you consistent with your general practice? So if, for example, you find yourself testifying in court, you know you do it the same way each time? I do it twofold. One is so that it, you can be pretty nervous or you just need to have a, a general practice that you do each and every time you go to a case um, so that it is uh, investigated the same. <clears throat> so what items were taken out, do you recall, were taken out of the bags? One of the bags had two white tennis shoes, a left and right. Um, one bag had a pair of blue jeans, and one bag had a blue long sleeve shirt and a green t-shirt. Which is the bag that did not have a trained final response by Molly? The bag with the two items, the blue shirt and the green t-shirt. Okay. Did you then have Molly search the four individual items outside of the bag? The shoes being one item, yes. The shoes being one item, the pants being one item, and then the separate, the two shirts separate. Yes. May, um, I, may I approach the exhibits, Your Honor? Yes. Those two bags, and then there's a blue shirt and a green T-shirt. This looks like the items in the third bag, but then they took Yes. So the first two items I held up, the pants and the shoes, Molly has indicated train final response, odor of human remains on the exterior of the items in the fourth bag. Ask and answer leading. Yeah, but I think he's trying to set this up, so I think it's okay. Go ahead. Do I have the correct items for train final response? When they were in the bag, she indicated on that bag with what turned out to be tennis shoes and that bag, which, which turned out to be blue jeans. And then she searched all four of these items individually, including these 
yes, those two items were then, everything was set out, and those two items were with the bag that came in on the ground. When Molly did the follow-up search with the items out of the bag, what final, train final responses did she give, if any? Um, she indicated on the shoes again, providing her train final response to the SIP that she detected the odor of human remains. She did the same thing on the blue jeans. And then she went up off lead and indicated she sniffed the blue shirt. She provided her train final response of a SIP that she detected the odor of it and then moved away. Um, I don't recall how it was determined, but I asked if they would move the blue shirt out of the vicinity. And I resent her again, and she went up to the green shirt and uh, where the blue shirt had been. She put her nose to the blue shirt, I'm sorry, green shirt, and then went over to where the blue shirt had just been removed and provided a fit, train final response that she detected the odor of that. So she did not indicate to the so in summary of the four items, Molly had a train final response for the shoes, the pants, and the outer shirt, but not the green shirt. Assuming that the blue shirt was worn on the outside, yes. And Judge, if I could publish previously admitted people's 204, 207, 214, and then 212. You may. Thank you. So I'm going to put the items up on the screen if that helps because we've got them all bagged in evidence down here. Are these the shoes for the train final response, as you recall? That is the pair of shoes, or the bag in the shoes that Molly provided a train final response to the order of human remains. And then 207? Does that look consistent with the pants that are in the evidence bag, et cetera? Yes. Okay. And then 214, this is going to be the shirt that you, um, well, tell the jury. Um, the blue shirt. When it was outside of the bag, Molly provided her train final response of a SID indication that she detected the odor of human remains to the blue shirt. Okay. And then 212, please. This T-shirt, is this the green shirt you're referring to? The green T-shirt, Molly did not provide her train final response that she detected the odor of human remains on it. So I understand you don't want to assume which shirt was worn on the outside and which was worn on the underneath. But it's the T-shirt that Molly never trained final response on. It was the long sleeve outer shirt, style, outer style shirt that had the trained final response. That is correct. Okay. After you tested the clothing, did you have occasion to walk through the impound lot at the police department or at the sheriff's office? Um, the building we were at was in a fenced-in area. And when we were exiting after finishing this part of the work, the investigators asked if they could do a little experiment with the dog. What experiment did they have in mind? They asked me if I'd be willing to have Molly off lead and sniff like, I don't know, half a dozen cars, maybe there was more, that were all um, sporadically, but some consistency um, placed in that uh, I'm assuming impound area. Objection, Your Honor, and, and perhaps we approach on this. Sure.
it's just going to take me a minute to find that citation for council. So and that's fine. Um, should we take like two short breaks, part of it while you're doing this, and then? That's fine, Judge. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Let's, let's try and let's try and start up in ten minutes. So at uh, twenty till, remember my admonitions. Everybody rise for the jury. And Cindy, just have them outside. Actually, Judge, I think I found it. So. Okay, well, we're already headed in the break there, actually. <laughs> All right. Show it to Sure. Them. Happy to do it. Twenty-four five thirty-seven. Discovery. Thanks. You're welcome. 